How's it going, Chargers fans? Welcome into the Guilty as Charged podcast. Today, we're going to talk about some of the mock drafts we've seen around the league over the past week or so. Just some of the, the big name sites, big name guys, uh, Daniel Jeremiah, uh, the Draft Network, Pro Football Focus, that sort of thing. Just going to go over who the Chargers are apparently going to take at 17. According to these analysts, not a ton of mock drafts to go off of here. I have five um, different players that are mocked to the Chargers that I want to discuss. And then, of course, two more that were mocked to the Chargers that I don't think, uh, is, it's, I don't think it's going to happen, but it's worth mentioning. So at least you know. Uh, so let's dive right into it. So the first one is Trevor Penning, the offensive tackle from Northern Iowa. We have Bucky Brooks and Dane Brugler, both uh, Dane Brugler from the Athletic, both mocking him to the Chargers. Now, the way this is going to go is I'm just going to have on the left here a kind of combined ranking um, from TDN, Pro Football Focus, and Bleacher Report. Bleacher Report in particular, I think, is the best for offensive linemen because they have Brandon Thorne evaluating those guys. So if you want to know where these guys are kind of at, I think that's probably the best resource because I trust Brandon Thorne the most um, of the offensive line experts that are doing rankings like this. Um, so we have the rankings there. Then we have the stats from 2021. Just a basic look to see what they did. And then a quick scouting report for me if I've seen or watched this prospect. Um, the best that they can do, the, or the best traits, the worst traits, and then just maybe some random notes if there's something to you know keep in mind. So with Trevor Penning from Northern Iowa, TDN has him at 23rd, Pro Football Focus 31st, and Bleacher Report 34th. So he's obviously not a top-tier prospect by any means, although the Chargers are picking at 17. So you're really going to get those guys that are kind of those late first, early second round, even if late second round uh, grades on them. And so someone like Trevor Penning, the left tackle from Northern Iowa, is probably going to be there. Now, like I said, he did be left tackle for Northern Iowa. It's kind of funny to watch an offensive tackle wear purple and then number 70, play left tackle, and then be mocked to the Chargers because that was basically Bashan Slater. So it's cool to see him there. He led 11 pressures and one sack in 2021. The, he's the only guy I have um, of the offensive tackles that were mocked. He's the only guy that I included the number of penalties for because some guys are like three, four, five, whatever. Uh, Trevor Penning had 16. So that's something to keep in mind as you're evaluating him. And something that I used to kind of knock some of his traits. So let's talk about the best traits. To me, it, the very, most obvious thing, the thing that you hear, the first thing that everybody says is that he is the meanest guy on the field. I think people watched Tre Tevin Jenkins last year and saw that play through the whistle, you know, taking um, Joseph Osai to the sideline. That's kind of a, a Trevor Penning thing, except Trevor Penning, I feel like, is a little bit nastier and loves to put you in the ground sooner. Like he's he'll play through the whistle too, but I think Tevin Jenkins was like a, I'm going to play you through the whistle and push you to the sideline. Trevor Penning, to me, is more like, I want to put you in the ground. I want to put you six feet under, you know, pour some dirt on your casket and uh, and call it an evening. So he's a very, very nasty guy. I think in a phone booth, he is very strong, very hard to get around. And I think that's very evident when you watch him play against, you know, uh, lesser competition, if you will. His worst traits, though, I got to talk about the penalties. He has 16 accepted penalties and three that were either declined or offsetting. So 19 total penalties called on him playing for Northern Iowa. Not exactly the best thing that you want to see. And Stephen and I are close-ish on our grades for him, but I've knocked him a little bit more on his hand placement because I think if you have 19 penalties, you know, playing at Northern Iowa, and you can tell it's not just like, oh, false start or something like that. It's holding, it's wrapping your arm around a guy's neck, it's hands to the face things that are just going to cost the chargers. And we've seen it, you know, cost many drives this season. So having a guy that has that many penalties, not great. Um, I honestly, people say that his lateral mobility is good. They like it. I personally don't, I think he's just better in a phone booth. Maybe that could change with the right side switch, but to me, he's just not the most mobile guy laterally. And I don't know if that's going to work very well for the chargers. Obviously these two people do think that's going to work for them in the system that they run. I don't remember Brian Blaga exactly being the most nimble guy ever. He's certainly not a Rashawn Slater type, but I just, I don't know. The lateral mobility doesn't really work for me. And then of course, re reacting to inside counters. A lot of the guys on this list are really big and they tend to have an issue with speed to the outside or reacting back to the inside, just because they are those bigger guys. And you tend to see, you know, with most of those guys, oh, they can't bend. Oh, they're a little bit slower, you know, nimble for their size, but not exactly, you know, truly nimble. Certainly not a Rashawn Slater type. Um, the one thing to notice, or a couple of additional notes, he, you know, the people project him to switch to the right side, which which could be better for him. I don't know how exactly that works. You know, we saw Leatherwood do that to some awful results. We've seen Panay Sewell do that back and forth to some good results. 
So how that works out for Trevor Penning, I don't quite know. I don't know if he played right tackle at all. I guess I should have looked that up. Uh, so he's making that right side switch, um, and or if he plays for the Chargers, obviously he will. And then it is worth noting that he is working with Duke Manyweather this offseason. So he worked with Rashawn Slater. That worked well. I believe he also worked with Alex Leatherwood too. Uh, that did not work as well, but I think he's in at least in good hands. So some of the things that you see, you know, maybe that lateral mobility, maybe he just becomes more comfortable. There's something worked on there. Uh, the penalties could drop because he worked with someone like a Duke Manyweather. So I think that's worth keeping an eye on. So I have an early second on him, 83.125 out of 100. If everybody freaks out and it's like, oh my God, early seconds, why would you take him at 17? You're going to have like 10 to 15 to maybe 20 max first round grades on guys. And this isn't exactly a very good class, apparently, um, you know, from offense to defense. So to me, you know, early second, taking him at 17, I think that kind of matches. He's not my favorite guy to take there, but I do think I understand why you would. There are certain traits that he has and there's certain things that he does that you want to work with. So I completely understand that. So the other one, uh, there's there's two more tackles, this one and another one later on. Bernhard Wright, Raymond or Ryman, the offensive tackle from Central Michigan. Daniel Jeremiah says he's higher on him than most. And you can really tell from the rankings that, that everything's kind of all over the place, right? You have TDN has him at 57. Pro Football Focus has him at 19. And Bleacher Report with Brandon Thorne, of course, has him at 28. So definitely a wide variety of rankings. TDN clearly doesn't like him all that much. BFF, top 20 player, Bleacher Report, you know, kind of back end of the first round, um, you know, sort of ranking. So in 2021, only 10 pressures allowed in one sack. That's good. I think anytime you're, you know, 10 pressures or lower, that's good. One sack is fine. If you watch someone like Evan Neal and you watch the sacks that he gave up, the first sack that he gave up on the season was because the quarterback called on the ball for six seconds and you had to give, you know, Neal the sack because he was eventually beaten. But like, you know, it's, think shit happens basically. So him only giving up one sack is fine by me. To me, his best traits are winning early. When he wins early and he gets his hands on you, I think it's very evident that the strength and size, he's a big dude. I believe he's from Austria. He's a really big dude, latches onto you, strong hands all that good stuff. And if Daniel Jeremiah is mocking him to the chargers and he likes him more than most, I'm starting to realize that Daniel Jeremiah, if, cause we see like, he really liked Rashawn Slater as his OT one. It seems like Daniel Jeremiah really likes guys who can kind of wrestle either, you know, working outside or in that phone with whatever they have to do, strong hands, strong anchor. And I think that is someone like a Bernhard Raymond uh, to me though. And again, all these guys are big dudes. So he struggles with that speed on the outside. He struggles with recognizing stunts. This is, you know, he's new to the position, I believe this is his second year uh, coming from Austria. So he's new to the position and obviously it shows a lot of these guys are new to the position. You'll see the next guy is also new to the position. And so you can tell that they struggle with you know, stunt recognition, um, speed to the outside, just certain characteristics that you want to have worked out at the next level. They just haven't yet because they're so new to the position. Um, with some additional notes from him, I think this is probably the most important thing to keep in mind. He's going to be 25 in September which is older, <laughs> a lot older uh, for any prospect, certainly, you know, offensive tackle already being 25. Now, if you're Andrew Whitworth, you can play for another 15 years, but, you know, banking on him being a raw prospect and really, you know, not that great yet, in my opinion, and him being 25, you know, I don't know that, that that's a really tough one. If you, if you're okay with that, then obviously you can take him. Um, you know, but some people, I think like TDN, I think they, they took that into consideration and that's why he's 57th. So um, I will say as a guy from central Michigan, you want to see him go against better talent. So he did play LSU and I thought his best game that I watched of him was against LSU. So watching him succeed against tougher competition against, you know, like actual NFL team or excuse me, actual college teams is good to see. Um, so yeah, I'll be 25 in September. I have an early third on him. Um, I don't know how I'm going to rank him. I'll see where everything kind of falls into line. I'll watch more tape on him, of course, but that age of you know, being 25 years old, new to the position, do I want that guy to be on the Chargers, manning that right side right away where you have two years to win, you know, to win that Super Bowl, maybe three? I don't know. I don't know if I want to have him there. I just don't really buy into it yet. I completely see why you would like him. He's definitely sound. Like he's very coachable and he's sound. For him to go from Austria to the, to the to college and pick it up as quick as he has, I think that's a really, really good sign. I'm just worried that that's not quick enough, that there's a not enough traits there. I don't really think he's the best athlete, but we'll see. I mean, him being 25 is just a bit of a concern. So that's where I'm at with him. So Brian Perez from the Draft Network drafted, uh, mocked to the Chargers, Daniel Falele, 
or Falele, for, uh, the offensive tackle from Minnesota. Uh, he is the worst ranked tackle uh, among these three sites. So TDN is in 53rd, Pure Football Focus 39th, Bleacher Report at 44th. So not exactly the most liked guy. I guarantee you, though, maybe it's just my own personal bias because I really like this prospect. He is going to rise for sure. I think once he tests, I think once more people get their eyes on him, I think he's going to get that first round buzz, early second sort of buzz, because these, the traits that he has, you want to develop. So let's talk about his year. So he, he only allowed eight pressures and one sack. He allowed three pressures and one sack against Bowling Green of all places. Um, but otherwise he was very, very dominant as at least as a pass protector in most games. So to me, his best traits are that he, this so this guy coming into college as a freshman was six, nine, 400 pounds as a freshman in college. Um, I'm not that big. I don't think you are that big either at six, nine, 400 pounds. Now he has dropped weight. I believe they had him listed at 380 now, um, whether that changes, does he get a little bit lighter? Does he stay there? I don't know. To me, it doesn't really affect him. His anchor, though, um, because of that size, is is excellent. You're just not going to move this guy. He's a dude that plays through the whistle. Not a put-you-in-the-dirt guy as much as like a Trevor Pending, but a guy that plays through the whistle will push you off screen in the run game. There were several times you're watching him go, oh, bye-bye, and you just watch him push you know, someone off screen in the run game in pass protection. You know, Pass protection, not passive. It's, uh, it's really fun to watch. But... He's so sneaky mobile. And I think that's the reason I like him more than the other two guys that we just talked about. I just think he's more mobile. Hmm. I do think he's more mobile, but I think he's more sneaky mobile than the other two guys. are. I think there's actually a surprising amount of nimbleness there, whether it is laterally or climbing to the second level. He's not a guy that's like a screen block down the field sort of guy. But I do think him engaging first in the run game, that first um, defender, and then getting to that second defender, that linebacker, whoever it is, I think he's pretty solid at that. And it's very, very sneaky mobility. So um, I, I like all the traits that are there. I think because he's more nimble and because of that size and just that dominance of competition, I do think he's worth taking over the other three uh, or the, of the other two, excuse me, because I do think that like the number, like eight pressures in one cycle allowed, like the numbers are good. The, the testing is going to be really good. The size is really good. I think him picking it up this quickly, also being new to the position, I believe he's from Australia, Northern Australia, if I'm not mistaken. So him picking it up this quickly is really, really surprising. So I really like him. Um, the issues being, of course, the same thing, kind of like everybody that's these, these bigger six, eight, six, seven tackles that are new to the position, you know, stunt identification. You can see him get beat a couple of times by stunt ID. Bowling Green had a stunt work one time. What well, almost looked like he didn't know where to go, even though the play was, it had no impact on the play, but they did a stunt. And I believe somebody else picked it up, either the running back or the guard. Some, some, somebody was free to pick it up for him. So he had, he had nothing to do. So that's fine. The next play, they did the exact same thing and isolated him that time to have to pick up that stunt. And he didn't. So, I, you know, obviously you got to worry about that heading into the NFL. Um, sometimes he does overset to the outside just to compensate for the fact that he's not like, you know, he's not an amazing setter like a Rashawn Slater, right? Him going into, you know, vertical sets over and over and over again are going to be a bit of a problem early on. Um, and of course, speed across his face is a couple of times in the run game where there are guys who are just way faster and more twitchy than he is off the line. And you can kind of beat him across the face, um, across his face uh, as an in, in, interior defensive lineman, even an edge rusher. Um, but that's really it to me. I think he belongs. He fits the chargers best because these are traits you want to develop. I think if you're taking any of those three guys at 17, you want the guy with the most potential, but also a good floor. Like I think his floor is really good too. I think Trevor Penning, you know, is kind of the OT two of these three, in my opinion, but for Lele, he just has the traits you want to develop. So him being, you know, new to the position, but this good already and much better than a Bernard Ryman Raymond. Um, it is more impressive to me. The one thing I want to note though, is that he rotated a lot in game and I don't exactly know why I've Googled it a couple of times. I haven't exactly been able to find out why some people have said that, or the people on Twitter mentioned to me that Minnesota just likes doing this. He would rotate with number 77. Sometimes he wouldn't start a series like the first couple of games. Uh, he would start. Sometimes he wouldn't start on, on that first series. Why? I don't know. I did have a question of that being a conditioning issue. And if that is the case, then I won't like him as much. But if it's just because Minnesota rotates guys, and I do believe they rotate more than one guy, then, I mean, that's odd, but that's because that's the way they do it. That's the way they do it. 
Um, and also just like um, Bernard Raymond dominating LSU, I thought Philele's best tape was against Ohio State. And there are two edge rushers uh, from Ohio State that are ranked top 15 on Bleacher Report's edge rankings. And he basically like nullified them. There was nothing they could do against him. He kind of embarrassed them and in particular number nine. I don't know who that is yet. I forget. Um, but he just kind of embarrassed that guy frequently. And that's what I want to see him going against top competition, a uh, highly you know, ish ranked edge rusher um, and, and dominating. And so seeing that is very, very good. Um, so him being new, but that dominant early on, I think he's going to be a riser. I think this is one of the guys that you're going to see sneak into that first round because the traits there are just so enticing. Okay, Jordan Davis from Pro Football Focus, uh, the interior defensive lineman from Georgia, the guy that I think most people are talking about at 17, outside of maybe like a Jamison Williams. I haven't gotten to corners yet, but to me, you know, this is the like, obvious defensive choice is to take an interior defensive lineman. If you're not taking a corner, obviously, I hope they don't take a linebacker, even if Devin Lloyd is there. So them going into your defensive line makes sense to me here. And, you know, them mocking uh, Jordan Davis, the Chargers makes sense. The run defense was bad. It was awful. It's the reason they lost several games. You know, 40%, 40, I think it was 44% of the third of the downs that they gave up or third or fourth downs that they gave up were through running the football. So they need to get better there. Uh, TDN has him ninth. Pro Football Focus does have him ranked 36th. Um, I can take a couple of guesses as to why. Bleacher Report has him seventh. So a lot of people have him in that nice, you know, top 15 prospects order range. Obviously, Pro Football Focus does not. I would imagine that's because the numbers in the pass rush game aren't that great. Um, he did register 14 pressures and three sacks in 2021, 22 run stops with no missed tackles. And I do think no missed tackles is a good thing to see. Um, so the best traits for him, I just finished watching him. So it's a little bit fresh for me. To me, his freak balance and leverage is incredible. And I, I'm, I've put together clips to do a little film breakdown for him. And the first play that I, I'm going to show he it's a quarterback sneak and it's kind of botched because the center botches the snap. So the ball bounces and the running back ends up taking it for a first down to the outside. Really weird, but it's a quarterback sneak and he is triple teamed on that one because he's lined up right over the center. So both guards in the center are basically just trying to converge on top of him and, you know, quarterback goes over the top piece of cake. And to a certain extent, they win because they, you know, they get his shoulder pads down it's you know, three guys trying to block this guy and he gets onto all fours. He's still on his feet, but his hands touch the ground. And, you know, for whatever reason that the ball was botched, you know, the center just kind of saw Jordan Davis, maybe in botched a snap. I don't know, but his hands are on the ground. And then you just see him stand up and, and get three dudes off of him. It's the most, it's the most incredible thing for him to have that strength, that power, that balance, that leverage, it's really, really freaky. You know, I, I'll show that play because it's so hard to describe. But for him to have three guys on him, if him to just go and just stand up out of it, it's really impressive. So yeah, obviously he's very powerful. His run defense IQ is excellent. His ability to keep his eyes on the running back and engage with the offensive lineman and then shed that blocker to get the running back. It's, it's so frequent. It's so easy for him. He's so well coached. Um, and then, of course, he commands a lot of double and triple teams. And that also includes in the passing game. Now, sometimes they only rush, you know, three, and he takes up two, three guys just naturally because the other guys don't have anybody to block. But I think that's worth noting. I see a couple of times where the edge rushers, um, you know, they have a one-on-one -on, -one on the outside, and he's there with the two or three interior offensive linemen because he commands that much respect because of how big and how strong and surprisingly quick he is. Um, the worst traits, obviously, is that he has no real scheme versatility. You know, he's not a guy that you can move around and rush from the outside. He's not a guy. They tried stunts with him a couple of times or several times at Georgia and the speed to get all the way, loop all the way back around. It's just not there. That's just not his game um, and his lack of pass rush moves. The thing is, I will say, and I'll talk about this in the breakdown, while he does have a lack of pass rush moves, it doesn't mean he doesn't affect the pass in any way. You can tell several times that he's able to take on two guys and free up his guy. Or if it's one-on-one, -on -one, he bull rushes the guy into the lap of the quarterback. Quarterback has to throw it a little bit earlier. And you'll see several times he bull rushes. You know, it just changes the interior clock of the quarterback. Quarterback does it a little bit sooner and ends up being incomplete because that interior pressure, that A gap, B gap pressure is getting to him. And even though it doesn't technically register as a pressure on the stat sheet, you can tell that the interior pressure is getting to him because the pocket's starting to go collapse on him 
from his face. And so I think that's really, really impressive. Um, one additional note, which I think is really, 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 really interesting is that uh, Jordan Davis actually registered more total snaps in 2021 than Devontae Wyatt. I think the big issue a lot of fans have had is that that Jordan Davis just, well, he won't play many snaps. Why would you take a guy that can only play, you know, 60% of the snaps or whatever it is. But it's interesting to see that the same criticism isn't there for Wyatt who played fewer snaps. Now that does include special teams. So he played 527 snaps in 2021, Devontae Wyatt 482. That does include special teams. If you take away special teams, Wyatt does have him by I think 20 or 30 snaps, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and, and why it did miss a game. So why it does play more snaps each game, but the fact that Davis was able to play more snaps total, including special teams in 2021, about 50 more, excuse me, 40 more than Devonte Wyatt. I think that's notable. And so to me, the snap count issue doesn't bug me that much. And it's also worth pointing out that sometimes you know, people are like, Oh, he only plays, you know, 23, 25 snaps a game. But Georgia was also a team that got off the field very early and you didn't need to have to you know, sit there and play 50, 60 snaps per game. So Nakobe Dean, if I'm saying his name right, I hope so. The linebacker for Georgia, he has six games where he plays 30 or fewer snaps. You know, so anyone concerned that, you know, Devonta, or excuse me, that Jordan Davis won't play enough snaps. I think two things to consider are one, he did play more than Wyatt and two, um, you know, Georgia was just really good on defense as they've got off the fields. So they just didn't play a lot of snaps. And so I do have a late first on him. I should go back for the last two guys. So Raymond, I have that early third. So again, I'm not a fan of him at 17. Falele, I do have an early second on him. He'd be someone I would be okay with them taking at 17. I don't know exactly how my prospects will stack up, um, but I think that's about right for me. Um, and then Jordan Davis here, <clears throat> excuse me. Jordan Davis, he has a late first for me. I think the way we grade interior defensive linemen, um, we obviously are concerned about the pass rush stuff, but everything he does, whether it's anchor, whether it's power, whether it's playmaking, whether it's you know his the IQ that he has against the run, his ability to take on double teams, triple teams, he is a late first for me. It's a pretty late first, but he does have a late first for me. Um, so that's obviously a guy that I wouldn't mind taking at 17. Even if you consider the position value, I think just watching him, dominate you know you need to upgrade the run game you need a dominant nose tackle you can get a dominant nose tackle you should take a dominant nose tackle now i'm i'm more for them finding a sebastian joseph day or you know and, and akeem hicks play defensive tackle um you know and, and kind of upgrade your defense that way so you can take a corner in the draft so that's kind of where i'm leaning because the corner group isn't all that great I think the interior defensive line free agent group is better. So I'd rather upgrade there and draft a corner. But if Davis is there and they do take him, listen, you're getting a dominant player at his position, at a position of need at 17. Arguably, he won't be there at 17. So I think that works out overall. So the last one that I've graded and watched that I do think is worth talking about, uh, SB Nation has them drafting Jamison Williams, the wide receiver out of Alabama. t Dan has him at 15th, Profile Buffalo goes 17th, Bleacher Report 12th. I believe those are all grades based on his performance and rankings based on his performance and not based on his injury, you know, whether he actually is their 15th, 17th or 12th ranked prospect when you actually put it on a big board. I don't know. Either way, he deserves to be there and considered a top 20 prospect because of what he did in college, 79 receptions, 1,572 receiving yards and 15 touchdowns. So best traits. I mean, you, you know him, you've seen it right. Yards after catch. He's not like a, they didn't get him as involved after the catch as like a Traylon Burks or um, Drake London. You know, those guys that are more like the kind of like a lot of screens moving around the line of scrimmage, a lot of quick screens, but his ability to work after the catch is still incredible. Um, his ability to re-stem off the line of scrimmage, the cornerbacks across from him, he re-stems so quick and gets to the inside or whatever he needs to do to beat that corner. It's really, really impressive. And then downfield moves. There's one play against Georgia where I believe he's, he re-stems so quickly, he cuts up, he goes way up the field, is beating the corner. Then he sells, he stutters just a little bit to sell that dig, stops and then goes again. And the safety bites, and he just roasts both the, the Georgia defenders for a touchdown. It's, it's incredible. It's such a fantastic play. Um, so his ability to work after the catch, his ability to re-stem, his ability to do different things and be creative downfield, whether it's a deep cross or whether it's a go, whatever it is, his ability to do that is fantastic. The only, you know, the worst traits, like lack of physicality, I guess, you know, like, you know, do you see Tyreek Hill busting, you know, 
breaking tackle. Well, no, you see him breaking tackles, but you see him, you know, physically imposing and lowering a shoulder into guys. Probably not. Same thing with Jameson Williams. He doesn't really just like lower his shoulder into guys. He's not really much of a contested catch guy either. This is a guy you just put the ball in his hands, let him go, throw it downfield, put it in his hands, whatever. But not exactly a guy that you want to, you know, do a, a goal line dive with, I guess. Um, so not just not just not the most physical guy. No goal line fades for this guy either. Um, and obviously the additional notes being the ACL tear. It sounds like progress is going well. Of course, they're going to say that before the draft. Whether it's actually going well, we don't know. We'll probably find out more once the draft season comes around. Um, but it seems like it's going well, so that's good. So I do, you know, <clears throat> how how I end up great or ranking him will sort of depend on that injury. Right now, I do have a late first on him. Where I rank him, though, obviously will depend on that injury. Um, but again, so Davis and um, oops, Davis and Williams here both have a late first on me, so I like them, obviously. Um, so two other guys that were mentioned, I'm just going to blow through real fast. Pro Football Network's Tyler Linderbaum, the center from Iowa. Um, I don't know if they know this, but Corey Lindsay was just voted an All-Pro, uh, a second-team All-Pro, and a Pro Bowler for the Chargers. So they don't need a center. But, you know, that, that, that's media coverage for the Chargers for you. Um, there's no indication that they wanted him to play guard either. So I think they just legitimately thought that the Chargers needed a center. Oops. And then George Karlaftis, the edge from Purdue. Sounds like he's a great player, right? Everyone has ranked him as a top seven, top 10 prospect. Um, <coughs> woo, coffin today. But I just don't, I don't really see that. I, I don't see that him making it to the Chargers. If he does, great. I have not watched him. So maybe there's something there and he might slide. But based on how everybody ranks him, I don't expect him to be there. So I'm not really going to talk about it. So to me, it just comes down to, you know, the final ranking here. Where would you have each of these guys? And, and personally, I, I would go Jordan Davis over Jamison Williams right now. I do still always believe in the trenches over the skill position guys. Um, well, at least in terms of, you know, the guys that are here, especially over a wide receiver. I think wide receiver, you can find like a Mechie actually in the second round who also did Terra's ACL. Um, but Davis to me, especially because he doesn't have that medical ACL injury, you can talk about weight issue as another thing, but I'll, I'll wait till we get those combine measurements and then they do the physicals with him before I judge whether he's out of shape or, or not, you know, in shape enough. So to me, Jordan Davis would be the favorite of these five, Jamison Williams next. And those two are kind of my top tier of this list. It would be Jordan Davis and Jamison Williams, you know, from there, you know, maybe a corner instead. Um, but of the offensive tackles, I would go for Lele first because I think he has the traits that you want to develop the most and then Penning and then Raymond. So that is the top five. I, whether you like these guys or not, let me know. To me, the first four are all worthy selections at 17. That might change with a little bit more film study, but I could see, you know, either of these guys you want to go with the need with Davis or just the electric performance of Williams go for it. You want to develop guys like a Falele or a Penning, you know, Falele probably being better to develop, but Penning being that nasty guy on the right side of the line. I totally get it. Either way, you know, these are positions of need. I think these are good players. I do think Davis and Williams are like the top tier of this group, um, but still I would be okay with Falele and Penning. Raymond's the only one I'm just not sold on because I just don't think there's a whole lot there. And I don't think, you know, I think him being 25 in September is a bit of a problem. Um, so that's it. So that is the, the mock draft roundup so far. I will obviously, you know, update this as we go. I'm sure in a month we'll have completely different names a month after that. We're definitely going to have new names once we hit free agency, but for right now, Trevor Penning, I'm okay with that early second on him, Bernhard Raymond, um, early third on him for me. I'm not okay taking him there just yet. Daniel Falele an early second for him. For me, I would take him at 17. That's okay with me. Jordan Davis, early first for me, or excuse me, late first for me, I would take him. Jameson Williams, barring injuries being, you know, something we don't know about, uh, you know, the recovery not being that great. I would take him in the first round as well at 17. So a lot of guys to like. Linderbaum and Karlath is not going to happen. So these are my top five. And that's it. So that is the current mock draft roundup. Let me know what you guys think. If there's a player that was not mocked to them yet that you really, really want them to take, let me know. I know a lot of people are fans of like a Burks. Some people are fans of um, Sauce Gardner, you know, all those guys. So let me know if there's a favorite among this list that you like or a favorite that we did not mention that I did not mention that you like. Um, it's getting exciting. So we'll, we'll see what changes in the coming weeks. Like, for example, Daniel Jeremiah last year mocked, I think it was either J.C. Horn or Caleb Farley. 
And then Jalen Waddle to the Chargers. Now, you know, Horn wasn't there and Waddle wasn't there. And I'm sure he would have mocked Slater to the Chargers if he had known he were going to be there. But, you know, things change, obviously. Some guys go earlier, some guys go later, some guys fall. So hopefully this worked out, works out. They're picking at 17 and it should be good. So we'll see how that goes. Thanks everybody for listening. And as always, bolt up.